welcome to Dr. Bruce, a brand new podcast about our place and future in this most wondrous universe. When I was 14 years old in 1976, I... I was literally walking out in the sagebrush in the town we lived in, in British Columbia, thinking, what is the most interesting idea that I could work on? What is the wildest, weirdest for a nerd kid? And I wasn't into computers. We didn't have any computers in our town, but I was into designing board games and complex worlds and systems and stuff. And it popped into my head, the most interesting project to work on would be how did life start? But specifically, if you had a bunch of molecules or blobs that were like Lego blocks that weren't life, how the heck did they get together, organized enough to create a machine that a machine emerged, then that machine could do a bunch of jobs, including copying all of its parts and making a second machine. This is freaky. And I was like, this is really interesting. So I started to work on this problem initially mentally, then I got into computers in 1981 and I built virtual worlds and I built cellular automata systems and I was just obsessed with this, but I was unable to really get to work on it until 1985 when I was in graduate school at University of Southern California and they gave me my own VAX 750 mini computer, which I, it was amazing. You know, as this silly, oddball graduate student, I had an ARPANET account, a USENET account, you know, I could do all this stuff. And they gave me a Tektronix display screen, which had really deep, I mean, these large CRTs. They could, do, it could send all these graphical commands and draw all this fancy graphics. And I can do this now. So I started coding the summer of 85. I was like coding, coding, coding. And then I realized, you know, it's a bigger problem, but I coded a whole system that could start to show graphics and it was doing little on and off cells and it was going to have multiple tiers that talked to each other and I had all the whole architecture in my head. And then I realized I went into the library to look up literature and there was almost nothing. It was a book by John von Neumann in the 1950s, some Russian guys had done this very little. I talked to my advisor, it was clear he didn't understand a word of what I was saying. It sounded good, and then I said, how am I going to put a committee together for a PhD? And it was like, clear, I'm kind of in trouble. Um, there's no field. There's no field called artificial life, which emerged two or three years after that. So I said, you know what? I, I hate having to go eat really bad happy hour food every day and be in this university, which is in a war zone in central Los Angeles. is just depressing. I just can't see sitting here for five to eight years. And I went out into the world and built a whole bunch of software. And then I kept working on this. In the 1990s, I formed an organization called Biota, biota.org. You can get cool domain names. I mean, back in 94, you, you, you went into a, a terminal window and edited a file practically to get a domain name. So I got my last name.com and a bunch of cool, you know, there was no really ISPs doing that. It was like, just get a domain name. So I got biota.org and biota means life, the totality of life. And that became a container for projects to try to create virtual worlds that would have lifelike properties. So we, we created a, 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 a world in which virtual plants grew based on mathematical models called Lindenmeyer systems. And that was super cool. And that ran at SIGGRAPH. And people could grow plants in these worlds in 1997. We held four conferences. So I was, in a sense, biding my time waiting to get back to this hard problem. So the, the first conference we held, we had 60 attendees climbing a mountain <laughs> to a fossil quarry near where I grew up in British Columbia called the Burgess Shale. And the Burgess Shale was discovered by accident by James Doolittle Walcott on horseback in 1905. And it has, it's a library of the early Earth's oceans full of critters, but they're some of the first critters that could swim and compete for resources. Before the, the Burgess Shale 535 million years ago, all they see is little mud traces and great big things that will look, look like doormats that nobody can quite figure out if they were a plant or an animal. So something really big happened between about 560 and about 535. It was called the Cambrian Explosion. Uh, paleontologists don't really like to use that term anymore. 
but it was fascinating. So I said, you know what, to start the biota project, you have to build, to do anything of significance, especially on big questions, you must build a community. And to do that, we're gonna have a mythical first meeting, Digital Burgess, the Digital Biota Conference at the Burgess Shale. So in September of 1997, I had 60 researchers, scientists, artists, climbing a mountainside at 5.30 in the morning to get up to the edge of this mountain with a Discovery Channel crew carrying huge cameras uh, to visit the Burgess Shale. And it's this thing that's about two, 300 long, feet long, cut out of a mountainside, and it's flat shale pieces. And as you chip away at them, you pull out, you find body preservation, soft bodies, like jellyfish-like things. There were no bones then. This is pre-bones. And so this is a rare preservation, too, too long to explain how that happened. But so we did that, then we did a conference in Cambridge, England with Richard Dawkins and Douglas Adams, two really interesting people. And Douglas Adams from the writer perspective, you know, all his bizarre ideas and his funny English way of talking about big things. In fact, the project I'm working on now called Genesis Engines is dedicated to the memory of Douglas Adams. Then we held a conference in the heart of game developer land at San Jose State with Rudy Rucker and Bruce Sterling, who are science fiction writers. They have dreamed up worlds where there is artificial life and second genesis and life forms for their whole careers and writing their sci-fi books. Who better to tell us about that? The fourth one we had was in the bowels of the American paleontological convention with real paleontologists and would poke their head in our sessions. A few of them would come in, most of them think it was flaky. You know, there's no rock hammers and there's no images of fossils and there were some trace fossils, but we got the people that were interested in the overlap between life and the computer, you know, if it's possible, or modeling it, and life as it emerged on the Earth. So about that time, I got together with Terence McKenna, so I had all this background. I also had written code for 10, 12 years and products and stuff like that. And so t one night in Hawaii, Terence and I sat up really late in his upstairs library room which unfortunately every single book in that room is now gone because of a fire uh, at the Esalen office in, in uh, downtown Monterey. You know, it was a real shame. But we came to the, the question of novelty and life in the computer and Terrence at that time was kind of joining his ideas of the singularity with this idea of some kind of end of time, time wave zero idea, and he'd sort of put two and two together kind of in, a, in an idiotic way, in my opinion, a completely wrong association, that the internet somehow would lead to this breakthrough at the end of history. Just because he could now get email through a dish on his house in Hawaii, he thought, my God, you know, things are gonna come down through time portals, you know, really putting a huge amount on the tech. So I thought, I'm going to kindly and gently try to give this man a lesson in how the internet works. Because it was clear that, that Terrence McKenna didn't know what a packet was. So we sat up for hours, and I said, Terrence, let me draw it out for you. Here, here's how stuff works in the internet. And here's why, here's how stuff works in an ocean. You know, molecules are working all at the same time. They're and stuff is happening that's so computationally hard to model, the internet's pathetic. The internet is not, in fact, it's, it's probably never going to be a rich enough substrate to generate true emergence like a proto-life form, never. And we had seen that by holding, what, by holding three conferences on everybody who had built such systems. And hours later, you know, Terence is, you know, kind of listening, he listened to me pretty much, but a month later he's on the radio and. KQED in San Francisco talking about the same stuff. So he took it under advisement, but didn't feel the need to change the rap. So Terrence dies, and I say, you know what, I'm still working on this thing. And his idea of novelty was interesting, that there's some force that increases uh, complexity in the universe. Not only Terence, Terence never worked on it. He observed it and described it in Joyce and language. There were real people, serious people working on this for real. One of them was Stuart Kaufman. Does anybody know Stuart Kaufman? A couple of people. He's written some absolutely beautiful books. 
they're very heavy on the theory and the math, but he writes beautifully and he can describe this stuff. Um, one of his best is called At Home in the Universe. And I thought, oh, I, I, I said, it's 2005, 2006, and I'm going to turn 50 in 2012. You know what? I better get the damn PhD because they're saying, kid, you know, if you want to get into science and do the science, you have to have the union card. Get your freaking PhD. Don't don't take six years. Do it in as, as efficient a manner as possible. So 2008, I was registered in an international PhD program, uh, and I finished it in exactly three years, day, day, door to door in 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 that time. And what I took on was this challenge of novelty. Thought about it for. 20, 25 years, interesting talk, talks with a person like Terrence about it. We built a system to see if we could get, we could watch novelty at work. Well, what is novelty? If you have, you know, colored marbles with sticky bits on them and they're rolling around in some kind of a, you know, nice v felt covered table, and they're kind of doing their thing and, and some of them have sticky bits on one side and they managed to come into contact with the sticky bits, and now there's two marbles that maybe are rolling together or twirling. That's novelty. So the table before the sticky bit marbles connect is, contains just individual marbles moving around. It's got a, its own dynamic. As soon as you get a couple marbles connected, they'll spin. They'll do a different dance, right, because they have a relationship. That's an, an emergence of novelty. But I tell you, if you have a, a table full of thousands of marbles, each with little bits of tape on two ends. You can run that simulation, those marbles, for a thousand years, and you'll never get beyond a bunch of cool patterns because it breaks down. They all, they all get connected, and there's no more cool things. You don't ever see four of them connected, or an entire ring of marbles connected. It just never happens because it's so improbable. And so simple systems can't generate more novelty. All of our computer software are simple compared to nature. Therefore, computers are in, in, innately ill-suited to do novelty. Nature does it all the time. We're sitting here, Burning Man is novelty stacked upon novelty stacked. So we built this system to say, let's, watch, let's create trillions of individual marbles called atoms in hundreds of thousands of individual little experiments and run them. But instead of running all of them, we'll only pick a few to run, run them and see if they produce lots of connected things called molecules. If they do, if one of them particularly produced lots of molecules, we'll take it as a starting point and run a thousand more experiments using the, the goodies that are in that one, and you start going faster through marble space. And my PhD thesis was all about what technique allows you to go through this marble space. So you have eight marbles connected in a whole bunch of varieties, you know, molecules are formed. And we found it, we ran for a year, we ran experiments. I initially built a cluster in my barn, which burned up. And our friend John Graham, who runs the webcast here, took pity on me. So after Burning Man in 2010, he said, I take pity on you. I will build you a cluster here at UC San Diego. And it came up, and we ran three more experiments. All the experiments failed to find the, the ingress and in, the pathway to novelty, except one, experiment number six. And if you can imagine the stress, I've been working on this for 25, I've been working on the PhD for 24 years effectively, I have three weeks to submit the thesis. Experiment number six is climbing slowly, but it's taking way more computation time to this breakthrough point where if we see the telltale staircasing where, oh, I got a bunch of experiments showing five molecules and now we have six and it runs along and now we got one with seven and it jumps. Now there's one with nine and now there's one with 14 molecules and the soups are getting richer. It was happening really slowly. I said, I'm going to miss my thesis deadline. I'm not going to be able to show a strong enough curve and I'm, I'm, I'm doomed. You know, the, the examiners are going to take my head off. You know, you didn't prove anything. And so we threw all the cores at it. We turned off all these other machines and went crazy, and, we, and it worked. The curve just kept going and going and going. And 
I was literally writing the last of the thesis on the train in France on the way to my defense, which was going to be in Ireland. It was like I was on the TGV from Geneva, finishing it and reading one more of Kaufman's books. And I said, oh my God, Kaufman talks about a fourth law of thermodynamics. Kaufman talks about that there, there is a law that causes the universe to complexify and not reverse, not reverse down to where all the marbles are disconnected. There's some pressure, there's some force, and that's the force that pushes the whole universe forward. So. I was able to cite Kaufman in the thesis, and I sent the thesis to Kaufman, and he said, you did the experiment I've wanted to do for, all, for a couple of decades. You've done that in your software. So I was able to get a, a quote from Kaufman, you know, a Nobel-level guy in the thesis. This is all good. But then, sitting on a park bench in southern France, uh, like four or five days before my thesis defense, I was at an Origin of Life conference, I said to myself, I've proven one little thing, but I did kind of want to get to the origin of life because these, you know, marble thing is all well and good, but we're not generating cells or polymers, we're not generating anything that would be a building block for life. We're just doing a little theoretical exercise. So I said, I'm freaking depressed because I, what I also discovered in the thesis is computers can't hack this problem. They won't be able to do this in a hundred years. In order to figure this out, I went back to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where John von Neumann built the first full digital computer and then gave away the plans to everybody. I went through Robert Oppenheimer's files from 1946 through like 1954 on how they built that computer on the construction, the schematics, the punch card decks. I went through everything and found out to my horror that they said, this was a contingency. Computers didn't work very well. You had to basically work for three weeks plugging patch cords on this whole wall to do a 30-minute calculation. So they wanted to make a computer where there are no patch cords on the outside, where you loaded stuff and it ran instructions that talked to the same memory as where the program was, and then it wrote out to something. And you think, well, that's obvious. That's the way my iPhone works. It wasn't obvious then. It was really hard then. They used vacuum tubes that you would use, you know, using good old you know, uh, vinyl deck players, great big honking vacuum tubes. But the genius is that the Institute for Advanced Study made a rocking machine. It was like the hot rod of the day, and everyone copied it. But they made, it was, it was a compromise just to get something working. It turns out we're still running those machines, those compromised machines. Why? Because it was about the best thing the human brain could come up with. Computing is really hard to grok. So John von Neumann, before he died, wrote in a book saying, uh, the computer we designed at Princeton was kind of like a thrown together thing. There's got to be better ways of computing, especially if you're trying to do nature and evolution and everything. And unfortunately, he, he died of a heart attack. So here's me in 2008, go back to the Institute for Advanced Study, find out that a guy wrote an artificial life program for this original computer, and he had the same compromises that I had at, at UC San Diego. I was like, oh, there's been not progress here. I went to Freeman Dyson, who's this venerable scientist at the Institute, and I showed him the design. And he said, looks good to me. And I said, OK, well, we went ahead and built it. So here I am sitting in the park bench in France thinking computers don't cut it. They can't do things in parallel very well. They, they can't do a huge amount of stuff non-deterministically and like nature does, and, and it's hopeless. And I'll never see the answer. And then a, a bingo idea occurred, which was, wait a minute, don't try to compute molecules. Let the molecules do the computing themselves. Make a, make, I, I came up with this idea of if you could blow up a party balloon with the end of a little pipette, you could squirt shit into it. It would be your little reactor chamber, and you could suck shit out of it down a tube and look at it. And then you could actually pop those balloons or blow up more party balloons or condoms or something, or some effective thing. And I built such a system in the summer of 2011. You know, out of parts and, you know, pool pumps and things like this. And then, of course, I take it down to Dave Deemer at UC Santa Cruz, who's an astrobiologist, a world renowned chemist in Origin of Life. He laughs and says, you know, nice boy, 
trying to do real physical things, are we? And he said, come down the hallway. And he had built this system with this huge plate of aluminum with little wells drilled in it and an automated robotic thing that would move it around and a station that would inject stuff in and a station that would dry the stuff out and the stuff that would inject more water in there and then a, a mass spectrometer thing. He said, this is our version of molecules computing themselves. And it was like, you gotta swallow your pride here. You're dealing with somebody at a whole different level. But what I realized is I said, Dave, this is what I'm calling a genesis engine, a, a way to use industrial strength robotic chemistry to crack the solution to how life got started. And he said, sounds like an interesting name. And I said, should I propose to write a book on it? Because it would come out of my thesis and the next work I want to do and your work. And he said, and so-and-so here and so-and-so and there. And I said, what's missing? He said, we don't have a community around this. We, we're just doing individual things. I said, Dave, I think I might have seen the whole architecture. And truthfully, I use visionary techniques. You know, I would say they're all on the Natch techniques, but I use visionary techniques. I use deep reveries. I use lucid dreams. I use all the stuff. I use Bose noise-canceling headphones as a mechanism to get into deep reverie space. And I pose my subconscious the challenge. And I saw the Genesis engine in one of these spaces. And I saw the experiments running. I was the molecule. I was flowing through a black smoker and flowing down the edge of a black smoker. And I became a film on the top of a pinhole on the black smoker. And then the film tore off with contents and then the, that pinhole generated another film and another one and another one and I saw this factory running of things of films that created these balls that had random contents in them and it's like holy shit and this took a three hour uh, on a flight to Beijing this is a three hour reverie that I could come out of draw them out um, have a coffee or something put the headphones back go back in and this vision had already moved on and now we're in cold water and they're slowed down it's like okay a little bit what's happened so my subconscious was generating this vision but i i was able to come out draw it then i was able to package it in s scientific language go back to the people who really know what they're talking about and they would dave deemer said that's a pretty good approximation of what we're already doing and that's a, that's unique there that's not going to be workable there. So a portion of that vision was viable. And so now we are at the threshold. I've recruited 20 authors. Uh, their job is to the mathematician, the chemist, the biologist, the philosopher, the religious expert, the fundamentalist, uh, the uh, SETI Institute, the alien hunters are writing a chapter. Uh, the ethicist is writing a chapter all about could you, would you, or should you build a machine that might get you to an origin of life in the laboratory? A machine that could run a billion chemical experiments that was run by computers, but the, the billion little experiments were in something called microfluidics that can be flushed out. They're basically computer chips that are chemical labs. But the computers are the seeing eyes of what comes out of those little chemical chips, and they decide what to run next based on what they're seeing. So the computer's doing a job it can do, yes. The molecules are doing jobs that, yeah, we do molecules, we are molecules. And the human mind is designing the end goals, and it's thinking that maybe life emerged from little sack balls of fatty acids that were fluffing around in the ocean and little areas where long chain molecules just formed and somehow if those two got together maybe you had the beginnings of a living system. So you could build a machine to simulate that ocean, why not? But you need industrial scale approaches and this is what origin science has not done yet. So I'm coming into this field, this crazy hippie looking guy from Santa Cruz, but if they put on a different hat and a different t-shirt, tie my hair back, although they don't care about the hair, I can go into the conferences and I can talk to the Nobel Prize laureates and I can look at and not understand the chemistry, but I can understand the overall architecture of how they fit into a bigger vision, get the book out, and then after the book comes the workshop. <clears throat> after that comes the conference, after that comes funding sources, maybe a billionaire that wants to fund and it'll be the, you know, the Sergey Brin Origins Genesis project, we need $100 million, please. And 
but the, what will be serious people will be involved because Dave Deemer and NASA Astrobiology are already building these machines. They just need millions of dollars and a, a couple of decades to make this thing work. So why take this on? <clears throat> well, it kind of gets to the fundamentals of who we are as human beings in our place in the universe. If, if we as silly primates, you know, doing all of our silly stuff, also take on some kind of fundamental stuff, um, it will have a huge impact on all of us. The impact of the space program in the 60s, probably from that one picture of the Earth taken on Christmas Eve, 1968, showed the whole Earth. That was worth the whole cost and this and that for that one picture. Every, that is a big impact on human beings. Human beings in low Earth orbit couldn't see the whole Earth. It was kind of like this and this. But when you could look back and see the Earth, it changed everything. So I would posit to you, and it, it may take decades, I may not live to see the end of this, that if you were standing in front of a big monitor and people had been running these Genesis engines, some of them are maker fair. You can make them in your basement. We have a high school teacher creating one in his basement for the book project. Um, you could have big labs doing it, but they would pass stuff off from Genesis engine to Genesis engine. They would pass stuff off. And the whole planet got involved and so somebody, somewhere, a computer system saw, saw the results, saw the magic. And what it would be, and this is my prediction, I could be wrong, is something I would call eternal bubbles. So when you have bubbles in water, they kind of go along on the surface a lot of the time and then they break and pop, right? They're always popping. But what if you saw bubbles underwater that had sort of dirty junk in them? And what happens to these bubbles, you can do this at home. You can do this with refined egg yolks. You can start in the morning, take an egg yolk, run it through four or five steps, and have a little white powder at the end of the day that's phospholipids. Then you can throw it into solution, put it under a high school microscope, and watch all this crazy shit going on, because that's called lipid chemistry. And there's like, the lipids are these molecules of heads and tails, and they're really weird, and they're not alive but they have so many weird properties, it's weird enough that you could probably build a living machine from them. And so they line up, and, and, and your cells are made of, you are sitting, you are lipid entities, you're just sitting there, you're just walking lipid sacs. So your cell walls are made out of these things, and, and along with a lot of other things, but they get together and they don't join with each other, they kind of get an affinity, they like to be next to each other, but they're flipping all the time. Because they're flipping, shit can go through from one side to the other. They've got together in this, in this membrane. Now, what Freeman Dyson told me was, I think it comes down to dirty garbage bags. Garbage bags of dirty water. And what that means is have enough of these garbage bags, which are, are, are lipid sacs or vesicles with enough random dirty water in them, one of them's gonna have a cool property. And that is that the, these sacs grow over time. There's lipid floating around everywhere. They tend to join the party. They come under the tent and they, they, the, the vesicles grow and grow and grow until they get elongated like a sausage and then they wobble apart. Some of them, the Jack Shostak's lab, they, they've characterized something called purling, which is a, a long super wiener dog vesicle and suddenly it breaks up into 20 new containers that then start growing. It's for free, it's just not a living system, it's just growth for free, you can do this at home. Well, most of those go on and pop. There's just nothing to you know, keep them stable. What if you saw a division, and then another division, and another division, and you kept tracking and it was, there's 50 in a row. That means something is stabilizing the whole process. Something is saying, uh, don't wobble apart until this thing happens until what, all the gunk from this end of the sausage and that end of the sausage is copied somehow. They made another set. That's called ca uh, catalyst or catalytic behavior. I hope these words don't just sort of confuse you, but it's like, wait a minute, we're not ready to divide because we haven't got all the members duplicated so they can rush over into the other side and be part of that other side. Something controlling that, how did that emerge? It was probably an accident but now it's on the run. Now what happens? The blobs are floating around, they're doing their divide thing. Some of them are not so good at dividing and they take a while to do. And some of them are rockingly good, but they're, they pop quickly. Now you have two kinds of, 
of eternal bubbles, if they're in the same soup, they'll start competing for resources and junk. What happens then? Natural selection. Darwin's face comes into the picture. That means the good little competitors go on and the ones that are not so good don't. And you have the machinery of evolution starting. This is before life. Natural selection is happening before anybody would say those are living systems. And even predation, even the big fat bubbles that take a long time to divide, start eating the stuff that's floating around from the little tiny ones that pop all the time. You have a predator prey that started before life. Predator and prey, way before. Now, the Genesis engine wouldn't produce life. It would produce this cool, interesting thing that if you ran it for another million years, a true living system would be coming out of it. It might have a simple genome to give instructions to make the copying better or something like that. It wouldn't be a living system. You could flush all this stuff down the toilet. It would have no consequence. But humanity would have done one thing. We would have answered plausibly the question, did you need a creator to start life? Possibly not. It's not conclusive, but this thing is on the way to a living system. That's a big thing. Now, how does that impact our belief system, our place in the universe? What if you find out it's really hard to create life? That means we're rare and special. We're, we're harder to create than we thought. You know, it still doesn't create new life, but it's, it's a big project to do. And I think it's one of the projects of the 21st century, that and looking back to see when the universe started or understanding quantum physics and characterizing all the fundamental building blocks. Those are big ones, but this one's a big one. So this is why I'm working on it. And I do it kind of in the name of Terence, but really in the name of Douglas Adams because he wrote so humorously about huge, ridiculous projects like the planet-sized computer that was asked the question, what is you know the meaning of life, universe, and everything? And it ran for two million years, and then the people arrived and it had been watching TV for a long time because it was so bored. And it gave the answer, which was 42. And why? Because the question wasn't posed correctly enough. So that's what I could come up with. So we're dedicating this Genesis Engines project to Douglas Adams uh, to keep a little humor on the picture. But just concluding, if you could build a machine that could do a second Genesis, you can create a breakout from the Earth. And I think all powerful civilizations will have harnessed evolution. You could create life forms. If you could really generate new, you could mar model the asteroid belt or the cometary halo or the Martian glaciers in your Genesis engine. Do a biogenesis of an organism perfectly suited for that environment. And it would natively live in that environment so that you can you can put biology or biota in the whole solar system all over the place, put life out there so that we can actually, we can't go out there without life being there first. That's why nobody can live in Antarctica for very long without hamburgers being flown in every day, because it's just simply not enough life extant there. Antarctica is like another planet in a lot of ways. So we need to do, a, if we're going to do a breakout as a species, we have to harness the power of evolution. And of course, you know, this is one more ping against religion that denies that there's something called evolution, and that we are an emergent phenomenon, that we're not the hubris of thinking we were created in the perfect image of something. Uh, so this is why Dawkins was interested in the project. And I think I can wrap that up, but um, no question period, probably five minutes for questions. Why don't we uh, pass the mic around? Does anyone have a question about the this whole crazy enterprise. Just purely dumbfounded. <laughs> if you want to know more about it, um, well, biota.org has a lot of podcasts. It's kind of like a salon, but it's all about artificial life nerds. Um, I haven't put the, the EvoGrid project, which is the predecessor, has a bunch of stuff, but I can send you stuff personally if you're interested. And you can reach me at bruce at damer, D-A-M-E-R dot com, and I'll send you my PhD thesis, and I'll send you the book drafts and things like that. A uh, question. 
Um, yeah, could you elaborate on the, that fourth law of thermodynamics that that I think uh, Kaufman you said? Yeah. As you know, there are laws of thermodynamics, and the most uh, the most feared one is the second law, which if you come if you come up with something against it, you're to be come up a cropper basically. But uh, that things tend to devolve from order to disorder. It's, it's actually more sophisticated than that. But what Kaufman is proposing is that that the universe, if the universe has consisted only of two types of particles, all floating in free space, that those particles, some of them would join together and it would take a very long time. And this is called a hypopopulated reaction graph. It's a fancy word for just a really diffuse space. His claim is that no matter what you do, no matter how much shock you put into that little system, you heat it, you shake it, you bake it, the bonds formed in that simple world will never all be broken. The universe somehow retains that complexity, even on a constant basis that can be observed and measured. And so that's a fourth law. The universe holds on. And that goes back to Terence McKenna and aggression into novelty and etc. So that's his idea. I mean, this is this is considered a slightly flaky idea in science, but Stu is a non-flaky person. He's a theoretist, so experimental chemists don't think theoretists. They think they're a lot of them are flaky. So even within science, but you need people like Stu to get out of the box. So that's that's what Stu means. Um, any other questions? For Mr. Mr. Doctor L. Uh, Bruce, <clears throat> uh, once we start moving in the direction of uh, creating life from scratch, or starting to create the precursors of life at any event from scratch, uh, what would you create with that kind of power? Well, actually, the um, you wouldn't be able to control the creation. The uh, the system you set up would create stuff that it was set up to do and stuff would be unpredictable so you, you'd see novel forms but you'd probably see them within the brackets of a certain type of plausible systems they would be super simple chemical systems but they would do cool things and and you could watch them do cool things so in the future, in 10 million years, when we really crack this thing, the marriage of digital and computation and chemistry, and we're really rocking on this thing, we could potentially dial in. Like, we have a grab bag of 50,000 starting complexes, which are really complex, and they're proto-biological soups that we could dial in that we would like X. And it's inconceivable to me now, you know, but in you know, hundreds of thousands of years, we might be able to dial a life form and have it emerge and you know of course we may be very good at putting the bricks together by then too and kind of making life forms out of existing bio bricks yeah you know, sort of a it's not really 3d printing it's kind of a different thing but the i'm a, an emergence dude you know greg venter will go and pluck a genome out of one thing and put it into another and 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 the cell will still work and he'll say it's artificial life i'm I'm saying that's just hacking. You know, we want to see the emergence. That's the real magic. That's the alchemical gold. Well, thank you very much for listening. This has been the inaugural podcast of Dr. Bruce, recorded in September of 2012 at Burning Man and released to you on December 31st of 2012. Check back about every two weeks at drbruce.org or subscribe to us in podcast feeds such as iTunes for regular updates from this world of levity, the Dr. Bruce Levity Zone. <laughs> <laughs>